Hey, good evening, guys. Thank you for being back with us today. It's the 24th of June, 2020. This is our evening Bible study uh, for Wednesday. I hope you enjoyed this morning's service. Uh, guys, I do hope that you have some uh, praise reports for next Wednesday morning. We're excited about that, and, uh, and so we're looking forward to it tonight. Again, guys, please send your prayer requests in that you may have. Brother Preston and I will be praying for them here. As a reminder, if you will, we have a friend of ours from the States, lives in Tampa. would like for you to please pray for his mother. She has been admitted into the hospital, diagnosed with COVID-19 now. As you've seen, the, some of the cases are on the rise in different parts of the world. And uh, so guys, let's keep everyone in prayer. Again, I, I'm a, I'm, I am asking you to please keep our leaders in prayer so that they can make uh, not only a... a um, a right decision on, on lifting the restrictions, but a common sense uh, decision. Uh, you know, I believe we, we have set up uh, safety precautions here in the sanctuary uh, to where everyone could safely come in here. We could worship together. We could make the needed alterations where we can come together and be with one another. Uh, so let's just pray that our leaders see that. Um, see that the way it should be and so that we can come together and worship together soon we don't know when it will be but guys do keep praying for that again i thank you for joining us this morning thank you for being back with us tonight and we hope and pray that tonight's lesson through by brother preston is going to be a blessing to you i trust that it will be and uh, so we're going to go ahead and go to prayer now and i'm going to turn the service over to brother preston as he will uh, teach us from the word of god today let's bow our heads if you will father in heaven thank you again for all that you've done for who and what you are we pray now for your continual blessing in our life. We ask you, Lord, we lift our leaders up in prayer. We pray that the decisions that will soon be made uh, will be made with uh, common sense and will be made with uh, righteousness. I want to lift that word up, uh, Lord. And the reason I say that is, uh, Father, uh, seemingly the churches have been kind of left out in these restrictions, Lord, and, 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 and lifting the restrictions. And we just pray uh, that it's all in your hands. We rejoice in thy salvation, all that you've given to us. We pray that you'd help us use uh, the proper judgment and the proper uh, decisions to make to keep everyone safe. And we pray for every member of Sarah Chapel, Independent Baptist Church, as well as Sarah South Baptist Church. We pray for every soul that attends those locations, Father, that you touch their bodies, keep them safe. And I ask you, Lord, to help us be able to come back together soon. And we lift up the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I ask you to bless this time together tonight. Amen and amen. Brother Preston, turn it over to you, bud. All right, good to be back here at church this afternoon. We will be in John chapter 9 in just a few moments. Get this thing started here. All right, John chapter 9, and we'll, uh, we'll read that text here in just a few moments. Uh, but uh, I was thinking about this. Some time ago I preached uh, a message. It's been a, a, a good long time ago back in, in Georgia uh, on... Um, uh, and, and, I, and I brought a candle out to use it as an illustration. And one of the men in the church went and turned the lights out in the sanctuary. And so the room was dark, um, very dark. It was on, in an evening service. And I lit uh, the, our little candle. It wasn't very big. Maybe if you can see my hand there, just, just a little small candle. And I lit that little candle and uh, held it there at the pulpit for a moment. And then began to walk around the church holding that candle. That little beam of light. And that candle began to illuminate me. Before that, when the lights were out, it was dark. That little bit of light illuminated me. But not only me, but for several meters out, that, that little light shone out in the darkness. And that small little flicker light changed the perspective of that dark room. Uh, the dark is lonely and scary place. I don't like the dark. I'm 42 years old, and I'm going to tell you, I still don't like the dark. The dark... Uh, you don't know what's there. You don't know what you're going to bump into. You, it, it, it's scary. It's lonely. And it's associated with wickedness. If you think about Hollywood, what do they do in, in movies and, and, and television shows when something bad's about to happen? It usually is in a dark area. There's darkness associated with, with wickedness. And we, and, and we know that our flesh is drawn to darkness, to, to, to sin, to wickedness. But light, it's, a, it's powerful. It tears through the darkness and it eliminates the feelings that darkness creates when you can have a little bit of light. We live in a dark world, but that doesn't mean that we have to take on the traits of darkness. And you say, well, what are you saying all this for? As we get into this scripture, I believe you'll, you'll be able to see, because we're, we're going to be talking about, uh, about a young man here in just a moment, but had three or four different titles about light and darkness as I was reading through this. Man, they sounded good. They sounded good. But uh, it just didn't seem to cover everything as a whole. And the more I meditate on it, we're going to just simply title this, The Traits of a Man Born Blind. 
Um, because I like, when I do use a title, and I don't always use a title, I don't know if that's a bad thing or a good thing, but uh, I like a title to stick with the whole lesson. I don't want it just to cover one little thing. And so, I, so, so we're going to call this Traits of the Man Born Blind. We're going to look at this passage mainly on the traits of this man that was born blind. But as we go through, especially today, as we go through the scripture, we're going to stop and look at just a couple little things that uh, I just want to mention. We won't devote a lot of time to them, but I do want to mention them because they are there. And Maybe at some point we can go back and look at them a little closer. And probably today we'll just get into one actual point uh, of the lesson. But let's look in uh, John chapter number 9, <coughs> verse number 1. We're just going to read probably the first seven or eight verses uh, here, John chapter 9, verse number 1. And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground and made clay of, of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is interpret, by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came see. Lord, I want to thank you for getting us uh, here today safely. Thank you, Lord God, for this chapel that we can meet in. Not everyone has that today, and I thank you uh, for giving us a place to me. And Lord, I know that one day soon you'll allow us to come back. If it be your will, you'll allow us to come back as a congregation as whole. But thank you for what you've given us now. That we can still uh, send the word of God out literally around the world. Not just to our people, but around the world. God, I ask you to use me for a little while. You know, physically not feeling that, that well. But God, that you'll just clear my mind and you'll help us be able to do what we need to do today. You'll speak through me. I ask God you'll continue to touch each member of our church. Touch uh, as we try to give them this lesson, that they'll be attentive and that we can apply what we hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we find here Jesus and his disciples walking by, and there was a blind man from birth sitting by the way. Now how, I, I got to thinking about this, and this is just a, a, little, a, little, uh, a little look at this, nothing, no, nothing major here, but how did they know he was blind from birth? I, I was wondering, and I thought that they knew, and, and we don't know. You know me, I like to think on these things. Maybe it's, it, it, again, it could be a good trait, a bad trait, but maybe Jesus in his omniscience that, as Brother Stagner has been teaching about, maybe he told them, hey, there's a man, he was born blind. Maybe the man himself, as he sat there, no doubt was begging. He was sitting there on the, on the side of the, of the way. Maybe he said, hey, I was born blind. Can you spare some change to help me? Possibly a person in town may have said, hey, you don't want to go that way. That man born blind sits down there and begs for money. You may want to avoid him. Or maybe some of these men uh, hadn't met him before and knew his story. We don't know exactly, but we do know that they knew. That's the important thing. But you all know me again. I like, I like to consider things. But we know that somehow they knew his condition. But then look what they say. Look at the disciples. Their first statement as they approach this man, they say, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And, and I'm going to stop here for just a moment before we get into the meat lesson. These men were not looking at his condition and considering how they could help him. Here's a, a blind man, blind from birth, sitting by the way. And these men, the disciples of Jesus Christ, they didn't say, hey, hey Christ, are you going to heal him? Can, can you do something for him? They didn't look to see how they could help him. In a sense, they were, their focus, they wanted to know the gossip. They wanted to know what had went on behind the scenes. They wanted to know why. They were saying, hey, what can you tell us about him? Did he sin? Did his parents sin? It was widely thought of in those days that uh, a condition such as blindness or any kind of uh, deformation or anything like that happened because there was sin in someone's life. Look at their statement again. I find it particularly funny that they said, who did sin this man? Now, it's easy to look at that in, 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 in today's time and think, well, what are they even talking about? He hadn't even been born yet. This man, how could he have sinned? He was born blind. How could he have caused that himself? He had not taken his first breath outside of the womb. What could he have done? There were some thoughts in those days of reincarnation and, and different thoughts of, 
Uh, uh, and, and so they, they were thinking maybe he sinned in a, in a previous time and now in this new life that he was going to be born blind. Or there was even thoughts that unborn children could sin in the womb. And you think, well, why would these men that are following Christ, why would they be thinking these things? Brother Stagger and I talked about this last week because uh, I was wondering the same thing. I thought, just, just trying to get a different perspective. But these men hadn't been following Christ very long. And they, no doubt, had heard these things, heard these, these thoughts, and they were in their minds. And, and, and they were still growing in Christ. And so some of these old traditions and thoughts and, and, and teachings were still in their minds. And maybe that's what they were alluding to. They asked then if his parents had sinned, causing his blindness. Again, not looking at compassion for this man, but with curiosity, with criticism. Hey, who sinned? Why is he like this? Now, can I, again, we'll get in the, in the middle lesson in just a moment, but I had to mention this. Can I say this? Let us stop looking at others in that same way as they did. Man. Who, who am I to stereotype someone else? Yeah. I don't know them. I don't know their life. I don't know anything about them. But why, for whatever reason, when we look at people, we want to begin to judge them upon the way they look at that moment. Hey, there's been some times when I've been working and laboring. I didn't look my best. Uh, there's been times when things have happened in my life and maybe I, I wasn't at my best. And, and so I don't want people to look at me in those times and judge me. So why do we do that to others? Hmm. You ever uh, stop to think what those people may think about you? Now, I understand, understand this. I'm not saying there are some people that act and make themselves appear in ways that they probably shouldn't if they don't want to be thought of that way. And I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about people that are purposely doing these things. I get that. But in general, as Christians, let us be considerate instead of critical. Amen. Let us see every human being as a soul, as a person created by God. And our first thought should be, hey, what can I do to help them? What can I do to be a friend of them? What can I do to make things better in their life? Hey, maybe they need Christ. Maybe they've never heard the gospel. What can I do? Man. See people that they need Christ in their lives and show them some love and not be so critical. Now back to this condition. I had to say that this morning. We know that birth defects can be a result of parents' sinful lifestyle. We know that. People that are on drugs, alcohol, different things can cause birth defects that are associated with sin. But sometimes things just, just happen. Yeah. Now we can go back if if you want to if you want to be technical we can go back to the root cause it was uh, the 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 original sin did bring about death it did pollute our DNA our, our once perfect DNA was polluted uh, back then and, and I understand that but as for direct fault sometimes things just happen in people's lives and it's not anyone's fault it just happens but I like that Jesus quickly answers their question. He says, neither hath this man sinned. He said, this man didn't sin. He was born this way. Nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. He said, no one sinned to cause this condition. In this specific, uh, can't talk this morning, this specific case, Jesus said, this man's blindness is part of God's divine plan. That's what he was saying. He said that the works of God should be made manifest in him. God had allowed this man to be born blind because he had a plan set for the future. The Lord already looked down through, the, through, through time and he knew that he was going to allow that man to be sitting in that place when Christ walked by. Amen. It was his plan that his works would be made manifest to him. That he was, he was going to perform some miraculous thing in this man's life that only he could do. That mm -hmm. was his plan. That's why he was born blind. Then he says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus knew that time for him physically being upon earth was limited. And now was the time to get the work done. And this man was going to help that. His condition, the Lord was going to work through him. He's the light of the world. And, and that light stepped into this man's darkness. I like that he used the words light because this man's born blind. And, he, and, and he's stepping into this man's darkness. A light of Christ affected this man in a way that nothing else could on that day. Hmm. And now finally, we'll get in the main parts of the lesson. I know I hope this isn't too scattered this morning, but uh, just trying to give it to you the way the Lord gave it to me. When Jesus showed up in this man's life, the man showed some attributes. He began to show some qualities, I think, that I believe that all men and women should put into place. We, we've studied ladies of the Bible for the past year or so, different, different ones, and we've looked at them. But I'm going to look at this man today and some attributes that he has. And think about this, when the light of the world steps into our lives, there are some traits that we should take on despite the darkness of this world. Yeah. We shouldn't take on the traits of this world. We are to be different. And first of all, and probably the only one we'll get to today, this man was submissive. The darkness of being blind had him begging, 
No doubt begging on the side of the road. Why else would he be there? Really the only thing he knew, he was doing what he knew to do. But Christ came by. And things, we, we begin to see a little th some things in his life that started to change. Now think about this. I understand that we, we see this is Jesus Christ. Yeah. And we would, know, we would look at this differently today. But put yourself in this man's shoes. He doesn't know who Christ is. And we'll get into that later on. He had just heard him speak these few words about working the works of the one that sent him. He no doubt sitting there heard him say that, uh, that uh, he was the light of the world. He, he heard these things, but he didn't know who he was. And here comes Jesus walking up to this man. He spits on the ground. I know this man's blind, but he knows what a spit sounds like, mm -hmm. no doubt. And he spits on the ground. And Jesus takes his finger and makes some clay out of the spittle and out of the dirt that's there on the ground. Mixed it up, and this man sat there and allowed him to put that on his eyes. How submissive is that? Now understand this. If Christ done that for me today, me knowing who he is, that's different. Yeah. But if, if B.J. Stagner spit on the ground and wanted to wipe it on my eyes, I would fight. Until, <laughs> or I would get away. And that's where you have to think about this man. He was very submissive to allow this to happen. He had no idea who was doing this to him. Amen. And this man allowed him to put this dirt mixed with spit on his eyes without hesitation, without any questions. He stood there, gave himself over to whatever Jesus wanted to do with it. And then Christ told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sin. It's an interesting place. Uh, again, we're just going to briefly talk about this, but as a man-made pool close to the temple, a place of cleansing, you can find, and we, I'll just give you the reference, uh, it, it most likely is fed by the water from the conduit that Hezekiah built to come into the, come into the city, 2 Kings 20, 20. And notice too how the Bible takes time to define this, this word here. And I think it'd be important because the Bible took time to say, which is by interpretation is capital S, sin. Several places in scripture, who do we find being referred to as the one that was sent? Amen, it's good. Jesus Christ was the sent one. Mm -hmm. Just in this book alone, John penned it down several times. And I'm going to give you just a few references. Uh, we don't have time because there's multiple just in John. But you can look all throughout Scripture. An interesting study. John 4, 34. Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John 5, 23. That all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. In this chapter, John 9, 4, we read the verse, I must work the works of him that sent me. John 12, 44 and 45, Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on, <coughs> I'm sorry, he that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me, seeth him that sent me. John 17, 25, O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me. Again, Amen. multiple, multiple times, Christ is the one that was sent. So we can see a picture here of Jesus as the sent Savior in this pool of cleansing. It's almost like here's Jesus physically there with him, that he sent him back to himself for that cleansing. It's good. The one and only one that can cleanse us of our sin, the sent one. And he's there with this blind man, puts this clay of spittle on his eyes, and sends him to this pool. And it's interesting, again, to see that this man, like some others healed in Scripture, didn't come to Jesus. How many times do we read in Scripture uh, where they're calling out, thou son of David, and they're, they're calling out to Christ, they're asking for help. This man says nothing. He's sitting there quietly, and as far as we know, there's no reference to it, at least, that he asked for anything. Christ came to him. The sent one came to him. I, again, I think this was a divine work of God. He sent, he sent Christ. He sent himself. He sent this man to be right there, and they, they met together divinely. He's not calling out to Christ. There's not any friends that are carrying him to Jesus, as we have saw before in Scripture. He's sitting there alone in his darkness, and Jesus went to him. Mm -hmm. Can I just stop and say this? I'm glad that he was sent to come to me. That's good. What do you mean by that? I grew up in church. I heard the gospel over and over again. I heard the teaching. I knew the truth, yet I chose myself to sit and dwell in darkness. It took the convicting power of the Holy Spirit coming to me 
to convince me that he was my only hope. I was not looking. The morning that I got saved, I'm going to be honest with you, I was not looking that day to go to church and be saved. I wasn't looking for Christ. I knew all the things. I had a head knowledge, but I knew I was lost. I was not looking for anything to happen. But you know what? He came to me that day. And I'm thankful for that. He loved me enough to come looking for me, even though I wasn't looking for anything. And he saw my need when he came passing by. That's why he was sent. That's why he came to earth. That's why he gave up his life. That's why he defeated death, hell, and the grave. It was all because he was going to come to me and offer Amen. me his salvation. The only thing I had to do was, just like this guy, be submissive unto him. To trust in who he was and what he had done. And this man was obedient in trusting Christ. The light of this world came passing by as he sat in darkness, just like I did in my sin. And this man submitted unto him. And the Bible says that he came back seeing. And I'm thankful. I didn't plan to say this, but I'm thankful the day that he came by my way. When he came to me, and I just finally realized, I just, Lord, I trust you. I trust in what you did. I'm giving myself to you. I understand that you died for me. And he saved me that day. I came back seeing things differently that day. Amen. And not only did this man, and we're going to skip ahead just for a moment because I want to look at his submissiveness. He submitted himself to this clay. He submitted himself to get down to the pool. However he could get there. I mean, you got to remember, he's blind. I don't know if people helped him, if he knew the town enough to be able to feel his way down there. But he got down there. He'd done what Christ said. And not only did he receive his, his sight that day through being submissive, but look at verse number 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And we'll get to that next week. When he had found him, he said unto him, Doest thou believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. Then he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. He was submissive with the clay and with the pool, but now he was submissive in to just taking Jesus at his word. He, Jesus, again, comes to him and says, do you believe on the Son of God? And he said, well, who is he? He said, you, you're looking at him. It is he that's talking with you. And he trusted him. He listens to Christ's words. And this man gives himself over to believing what Jesus said. Recognized him as a son of God. Trusted in his words. Began to worship him. What happened? This man could now physically see, but now his eyes were open spiritually. I believe this man got born again Amen. at that moment. All because why he was submissive unto Christ. By the way, if you're lost today, it's just that simple. It is simple. Be submissive unto him. Believe that he's the Savior. Trust that he came and died and rose again for you. Yeah. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. All you have to do is turn to him. There's no one else. There's nothing else. There's no other way but being submissive unto him. Amen, brother. And you and I that are already saved, and this is where I really wanted to get to could stand to practice some more submissiveness in our lives. So many of us walk around miserable. And you, I know you've heard this time and time again, but Christians are, seem to be some of the most miserable human beings on earth for whatever reason, I don't know. Why am I so unhappy? Why can I not find success? Why this? Why that? Why, why, why? Oh, poor me. Seems to be our attitude. I hate to admit it, but almost every person I know complains more than the worldly crowd. Mom. Why can we find fault in so many good things? I mean, I'm, I'm saying Christians can be given a free meal today, and you know what they're going to do? They're going to talk about all the things that were wrong with it. Yep. Most of us act as though we had the worst life of anybody else in the world. And we just seem to be comfortable dwelling in this darkness when we have the light of Christ that should be shining through us. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Why do we think that the lost world wants nothing to do with Christ because they see our life. And our problem may just be, why are we so unhappy? Why are we, why are we so negative all the time? It may just be that we're not in his will. We've not been submissive unto him. That's good. We're doing things our own way. And we don't even realize it, and our lives become dark. Can I speak from experience? When you're not obedient unto the Lord, you're not in his will. And when you're not in his will, you're not going to be happy. I think about children and when they get in trouble. They're not, they're not doing the things that the parents tell them to do. And they're unhappy when they're in trouble because they're not being obedient. Same thing with our relationship with the Lord. 
And when you're not in his will, you'll never be happy. I know from experience, when you're out of God's will, you will not be happy. Just briefly, I'll, I'll mention this. The Lord called me to preach. I, I, I did not answer him for four years. Part of that time was spent in making sure it was God calling me. And I'm going to tell you something. The, you feel like the Lord's calling you. You better take some time to make sure it's God. And I did that. But when I knew it was him, I remember one time specifically, we were, at, we were uh, at my parents' house. They were having a little dinner and kind of a church service at the house. And, and, and an old fellow there, an older preacher man was there, and he started preaching. And I got so convicted and so embarrassed that I walked away. My wife was there with me, and she said, what's wrong? And I wouldn't say anything then. But I later told her the reason that I got so, so, so bothered is I was so miserable because I knew that should be me. I should be doing what God called me to do. And I was seeing others enjoy themselves in doing what God called them to do. And I was so unhappy. And you'll never be happy when you're out of God's will. Being obedient is important in the, in the, to the Lord and it's a necessity in our lives. 1 Samuel 15. I'll just kind of briefly uh, tell you this story here that, that, that's written down in the Word of God. 1 Samuel 15, Saul was not submissive. He wasn't obedient unto God. He was told to destroy everything and everyone as he faced the Amalekites. 1 Samuel 15, 3 says, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they had. And spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Very simple words to follow. I mean, how much clearer can you get to the will of God? This is what I want you to do. He laid it all out there. Very simple words to follow, but Saul did not follow. He kept the king alive. They took the livestock of the enemy and claimed it was just to sacrifice it unto the Lord. And when Samuel confronted Saul, he didn't feel that he had disobeyed. In, in, in verse number 20, And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and I have gone the way which the Lord sent me. I brought up, and they had brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep, and oxen, the chief of the things which should be utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. Even though it was very clear as you listen to his explanation that he was being blatantly disobedient, he tried to make excuses that what he done was for good. God in turn rejected him as king. And as you read on the life of Saul, was never the same. He was unhappy. He was a, I mean, David went to play the harp to calm him because he was so unhappy. He was fueled by pride and jealousy trying to take the life of David. In 1 Samuel 15, 22, and Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Man. You may say, well, I'm not out in sin. I'm still doing a good work. I'm still a good person. That's wonderful. But none of that matters if you're doing so in disobedience. Saul thought, he, I mean, he, in his mind, he thought this will be a good thing. But it was blatantly disobedient unto God. There's a lot of good things we can do, but if we're not doing it in the will of God, we're wrong. The Lord wants us to be submissive unto him. And it's for our benefit. His will is always the right way. I've said that over and over. His will is where we'll find peace. It's where we'll find joy. It's where it's the only place that we'll ever find real success. Too often we trail off on our own way, but, and maybe even a good way, but we neglect being submissive unto God. Think about Jonah. He was blatantly disobedient to the Lord. He didn't follow God's will, and we know where he ended up. Mm -hmm. He wasn't out doing harm. He wasn't out running to worldly things, but he wasn't submissive to the Lord. He did what he wanted, and it got him into trouble. I got a very weird, I guess, uh, and I don't know why this came to mind, very weird illustration on this. We got a puppy. Man, she's just been, been wonderful to have around the house, but we're trying to teach her to be obedient, to do what we say. But when she disobeys, you know that dog, she knows immediately that she's done wrong. And this is a dog. This is not a human being. This is a dog. She knows she's done wrong. She'll run to her bed. She'll hide her face. She doesn't want us to look at her because she knows she's messed up. If she's picked up something that we told her not to touch, you know what she'll do? She'll tuck it away. She don't want us to see it. And when I speak in a certain tone, she knows immediately that she's messed up. Her head will drop. Her ears start to hang down. Her tail quits wagging. She's unhappy. You know why? Because she's been disobedient. Her, she wants to please us, but when she hasn't, you can tell that in her demeanor. She, she changes. But on the other side, when she's been good, it's different. If I tell her to sit and she sits, 
Or I, I've been teaching her to give me a little knuckle pound and I'll put my hand up there and she'll put her paw up and she does that. Other things that we try to teach her and she does those things, you know what happens? I tell her, man, I'll say, that's a good girl and I'll pet her and I'll give her a treat. And, she, and then, you know what happens? Those ears perk up. That tail begins to go back and forth. Why? She's happy. She's pleased us. She's been obedient. And that may sound strange, but that's exactly how I feel in both those instances myself. When I've been disobedient to God, I know it and it... it Drains me of my happiness. I remember 16 or 17 years ago, the Lord told me to sing a song in church. I, I just felt convicted that I should sing a song by myself in church. Never done that before. And I think it was for four weeks, if I remember correctly. Each week. The Lord gave me plenty of time. And I remember a couple of those times, the pastor even stopped and said, Hey, does anyone have a song they want to sing today? The Lord opened every door for me to be obedient. And I kept not doing it, kept not doing it, kept not doing it. One Sunday, again, I wouldn't submit. No one, I can't remember the song, by the way. It's been so many years ago. But I remember nobody else had ever sang that before. And a lady got up. She said, I just got this song in my heart. She began to sing exactly what I was supposed mm -hmm. to do the last three weeks. People got blessed. She was blessed. Uh, I mean, it, it touched everybody there but me. You know why? Because I'd been disobedient. And my head hung low. I was defeated. Just like I talked about that puppy. I, I didn't want anybody to even look at me because I knew that I had missed God's will. But on the other side, with the times I have been submissive, I thought about this this morning. I remember a time and, and, and that, that, I, that I was at a church, and it's just been a, a couple years ago while we were on deputation, and I, I was at a church. I had this message, man, and Brother BJ knows what I'm talking about. I had this thing all planned out. I had it written out, and it was just sounded perfect. And I thought, man, this is going to be a good one. I got to church, and the Lord changed my heart, and he wanted me to go a different way. And I sat in my seat, Saying, well, Lord, I, I, haven't, I haven't studied this in a while. I, 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 I've got this other thing prepared. And I began to weep. And the Lord just kept showing me, I want you to go a different way. And you know what? That morning, and I wish it was always this way, I was submissive to his will. Submissive to what he wanted. I got up and I gave the message the Lord had on my heart. And a young 12-year-old boy came to know Christ that morning. Man. Man, I was on cloud nine. I was excited. Why? Because I pleased the Lord and he gave me some blessing. There's nothing like the peace that comes from following his word, trusting him to provide and, and seeing the results that come when we do that. When we please him through our submissiveness, he gives us those treats that only he can give. Those encouragements that illuminate his goodness in this world that we live in. And that's what I want and that's what I need. But the only way we can take advantage of that is being just like this man and just be submissive and say, Lord, whatever it is you want. And I'm sure this man heard Jesus spit on the ground. He felt that clay touch his eyes, and it wasn't what he expected. That's not what he was there for that day, but Christ came to him. And it was no doubt uncomfortable. Again, can you imagine that? I keep going back, but it had to be uncomfortable. And I'm sure anyone that was watching thought, man, that's nasty. I can't believe he's letting him do that. But he still simply was submissive, let Jesus do what he wanted to with him. And when Christ got his eyes covered and told him to go to the pool, he went, and one that had never seen before came back to see him. See, there's fruits to be had if we'll just be submissive. It may be uncomfortable. It may not be what you had planned that day. You may have your whole life planned out for the next three years, and God begin to show you something different, and if you'll be submissive to that, the Lord will bless you. It won't, be a, it won't be the comfortable thing. It won't be in your plan. It won't be what you have written out, but just being submissive. There are doors that God will open that you never thought possible if you'll just be submissive. Mm -hmm. The key factor, as we've talked about many times, is just get pride out of the way and say, God, I'm here. Realize his way is the only one. Submit to him. Just do what he says. Trust him and blessings will come. The world's dark. I'm first to admit that it's hard to live in. But as dark as it is, we don't have to dwell in the darkness and we don't have to take on the traits of the darkness. And if we'll just submit to him, he'll illuminate things in us, for, for us, that we never thought possible. Let us be like this man and just, Lord, whatever you want to do. Whatever it is. It was a strange thing. I can't get over the strange thing that happened to this man that day. But he just submitted to Christ. Didn't even know who he was. But there was something different about him and he submitted to him. Allow the light to step into our darkness. I think even right now especially, 
As down as this virus situation has gotten us, more important now than ever to be submitted unto Christ. Yeah. It's really easy with the separation that we've had to want to do our own thing, go our own way. Yeah. But it's more important right now than ever to stay submissive. Whatever that will is for you, you don't have to fall into the darkness. You do God's will hmm. and just be submissive. It could go on and on, but next week we'll finish this up. We'll see two more traits uh, of this man uh, in, in, as, as we look on uh, as the Lord stepped into his life that day. Lord, I want to thank you for the good liberty. I pray that it wasn't too scattered and that uh, the words came out okay that it was a help to people. Lord, I pray that you'll take it and do what you will with it. And help us, God, to learn to be more submissive. Pray, God, that you'll touch all the people of our church, all the people around the world that are trying to serve you, be with Brother Stagner and his family. I pray you just bless them and help them. Be with all the missionaries here in the UK and around the world. And God, just give them a special blessing throughout the day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, praise the Lord. Well, what a blessing. That was a great lesson. I hope and pray that you uh, got at least half as, well, half as much out of it as I did. That was a blessing to me. And uh, a submissive role, dear, you know, that, that submissive role that we need to have in our life uh, is quite a It's a great take, great, uh, great illustrations that, that Brother Preston used tonight. I hope and pray again that you've allowed the, uh, the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God to be a blessing to your heart and your soul. Trust that it has. Amen. I'm going to say this, guys, and before we sign off, do remember our prayer request. Remember uh, Brother Mike Grover's uh, mother in prayer. Remember my, my boys back in the States in prayer, all of our families. Uh, pray that God will give us wisdom and guidance uh, when the church reopens and, uh, and give the government wisdom and guidance to use some common sense decisions in, uh, in uh, allowing the churches to reopen. But I want you to think about this. Uh, I forgot to count how many weeks it's been. I want to say 16, 17 weeks that we've been on lockdown, maybe more, who knows. Um, but you need to ask yourself this question. Have you capitalized on this time that's been down? Um, because if you haven't, um, th that's, you, that's your own fault. Uh, I will say that. Um, you need to capitalize on the day. You need to capitalize on the week. You need to capitalize on the month. Uh, the Lord's given us an opportunity to, to spend some time with him. To be still and know that he is God. Uh, there's never another opportunity that, that may arise that's going to give you uh, a time to where you have to sit still. And, uh, and I understand, you know, Brother Preston hit the nail on the head uh, about complaining. Um, you know, I understand people complain and they're negative and this and that. But the more seeds of negativity you sow is the more critical crops you're going to reap. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, guys, uh, this could be a positive thing. Pray for God's hand of protection upon us against the, the sickness by, 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 by all means. Um, but I will say this. If you're, if you're given to complaining about the current situation, I'm going to tell you to stop because it could be worse. Mm -hmm. Brother Preston, I appreciate that lesson. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a blessing to my heart. That was a blessing to my soul. And it reverberates what, what I've, I've, uh, I've just had on my, my It was just a blessing. God's timing was perfect today with that. And uh, so, guys, let's be encouraged. Again, uh, I don't think it's a mistake that the Lord laid on my heart this morning, that prayer of Hannah about rejoicing in his salvation. She mm -hmm. rejoiced in her salvation. She saw the joy of her sal salvation. Uh, guys, you're not going to, you need to rejoice in your salvation. Uh, David said, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Uh, you're not going to have that if you're constantly complaining or if your heart's elsewhere, whatever it may be. Refocus, recharge, recoil, and let's just get in there and get after it. Okay? Guys, have a blessed night again, Brother Preston. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll dismiss us in prayer. And looking forward to being back together with one another on Sunday. Remember, no fellowship this Friday. We'll take a break this week. And we'll be back together at 11 a.m. on Sunday for our morning service. And then back again at 5.30 p.m. for our evening service. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity and time to be together tonight. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for that blessed lesson, Lord. Thank you so much for the submissive heart Preston's had in teaching that today. Uh, no doubt it has been a blessing and encouragement, maybe even a conviction to others. And if it is, uh, Lord, I pray they allow that conviction to open up their heart and mind and make them a better person, Lord. Father, be with us now. Give us travel mercies on the road. Keep us safe and sound. Protect those, dear God, who are suffering from uh, any symptoms or sickness, Lord, this present virus that's going around. We pray, Father, Brother Grover's mother today. We lift her up to you in prayer as you may bless her richly and wonderfully. We pray that you bless Brother Mel, uh, bless Daisy, bless Carol, dear God, uh, Jan and John, Father Michelle and Matt. 
and the girls, Lord, and every other soul that's a part of our church uh, in, in one way, shape, form, or fashion. I pray you bless them, <coughs> protect them, and keep them safe. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, guys, have a wonderful evening.